<clears throat> My sermon passage is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 to 25. Bear with me. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to praise those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing right you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Live as free men, yet without using your freedom as a pretext for evil, but live as servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to the kind and gentle, but also to the overbearing. For one is approved if, mindful of God, he endures pain while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it when you do wrong and are beaten for it, you take it, you take it patiently. But if when you do right and suffer for it, you take it patiently, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin. No guile was found on his lips. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he trusted to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. The word of the Lord. Thanks be May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Would you bow with me one more time? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. I pray every Sunday in this pulpit, may God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. In preparation for this message, I pray God grant me wisdom and courage for interpretation. And I won wisdom. I can't preach verses 13 to 17. I can't preach be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution all the way down to honor the emperor. I can't really preach verse 18. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to the kind and gentle, but also to the overbearing. How could anybody preach about slaves obeying masters in the name of Christ? So I won't. But I have a suggestion for how we can deal with it. We can clip it out, like Thomas Jefferson did. Have you heard of the Jefferson Bible? Thomas Jefferson took scissors to the New Testament, and he snipped away all the things his rational mind couldn't accept. So there went all the miracles for him, and any other hint of anything supernatural. What was left mostly were just the teachings of Jesus. As repugnant as it might seem to some of us to literally cut things out of the Bible that we don't like, imagine what a better church it would be and a better world it would be if more people paid attention to what Jesus said than what people said about Jesus. We'd all be better off if more people listened to Jesus rather than treating him, treating him like Rumble the Bison or Boomer or Sooner or Pistol Pete. Jesus is our teacher and our Lord and our Savior, but too many people treat him like a mascot and ignore his words. Jefferson, to his credit and to his way of faith, did concentrate on Jesus' words, but by literally taking them out of context, he just cut the context away. I do not want to do that with 1 Peter and what it says about honoring corrupt institutions, even what it says about slaves and masters. I want to cut those words out of here and tuck them somewhere back in the Old Testament for context. I'd never throw scripture away like Jefferson did. This is the New Testament for Christ's sake, literally. But I'd clip these texts of terror, as people, some people call them. I would clip these texts of terror and some others and tuck them back in the Old Testament with one of the Samuels or one of the Kings or one of the Chronicles, the history books, because that's where verses about masters and slaves belong for good in the history books. 
because that was then and this is now, and if preaching is meant to encourage or exhort or expound or recommend good news, that ain't it. It never was it. And there's no way anybody of good conscience can pretend that these words, whatever it meant to the first recipients, ever were worth preaching. Not unless they secretly were working for an empire or dreaming of one, or shamelessly working for some master or dreaming of becoming a master. These verses and others like them have been used to abuse and to justify the worst things, as we know. No more, no matter how hard some people still try with different words. Jesus himself is a witness against oppression, even oppressive scripture. They asked him, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The apostle Paul got it. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, as he wrote, echoing Jesus in Galatians. Peter and the believers that he was writing to, slave and free, were in their own time and place, and they had to be bewildered at what it meant to be free in Christ since they all, slave and free, lived under Roman occupation. What does that mean? Maybe we can explore that sometime. It'd be a fine lecture or a Bible study, but it ain't worth preaching, especially now. When the American empire has lost its shame and two-bit would-be masters work in service to it, and some of them are some of our neighbors. Love them? Yes, we have to, Jesus says. But resist we must, as the Spirit of God and the best angels of humanity, always outnumbered, try again to lead. The rest of the passage is worth preaching. But may we realize now when justice is attainable that these words were written then to believers for whom it was not. When there were no protests in the streets for social justice, not for long, Rome took aim and never missed. When there could be no agitation for fairness under the law, let alone abolition of slavery, slavery was the basis of the Roman economy more than even that of the Confederacy. It wasn't for King Cotton, it was for Lord Caesar. When no lives mattered, if Rome said they didn't. Injustice literally was the rule, and justice truly was the exception for disciples of Jesus, slave or free. So the writer of 1 Peter pointed to the cross. For one is approved if, mindful of God, he endures pain while suffering unjustly. For to this you have been called. Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And this will preach. If we're following in Jesus' steps, we will suffer with Jesus unjustly and at our best without ranting and raving too much, lest we lose our focus. Listen, for Jesus' example of how to stay determined and not distracted in the face of injustice. He committed no sin. No guile was found on his lips. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he trusted him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you, we have been healed. Yes, this will preach. But it is probably a good thing that we don't have a big sign out front announcing Come, suffer with us. That is not the best sermon title. But you know what? It might actually get some people to stop and come in. What in the heck are you preaching, preacher? I'd say why I'm preaching the gospel. 1 Peter 2, 19 to 25. It's good news, and it's the call of God, and we need it after hearing the terrible backstory of 1 Peter 2, 13 to 18. And we need it after another week of the American empire striking back, led by a tin pot pretend emperor, wearing no clothes and no shame, and his minions in Congress all as naked as sin. So let me preach. 
Do you know why they're suffering where followers of Jesus are? Because if we're following Jesus, we go where suffering is because that's where Jesus is because that's where his father dropped him off to save the suffering world. So let's put it on a sign or put it on another banner. Come to Jesus. Come suffer with us. God in Christ loved the suffering world enough to suffer with it and to die for it. God in Christ in calling us to the cross calls us to empty ourselves and deny ourselves and to experience one another in a kind of mutual incarnation after the example of Jesus. To love is to suffer, to be diminished, to give and to give in to the ones you love. God is love. Love one another. Every single other, we have to get it in our head and heart and keep it there. But let it get to our hands and our feet. Love is not all who need love need, but love is all we need to go to them, to serve them, and to suffer with them. Put it on the church sign. Come to Jesus. Come suffer with us. You've heard me quote John Perkins before. Dr. John M. Perkins, an African-American minister born in 1930 in Mississippi. In the late 40s, he moved to California in fear after a police officer shot his brother dead. In 1960, he moved back to Mississippi because he'd become a Christian in California and he knew there was suffering back home. And Reverend Dr. Perkins has a warning for ministers called to serve the church. He wrote, when God calls, he calls us to a hazardous mission. When God calls, he doesn't invite us to a picnic. He calls us to go to a stiff-necked, rebellious, stubborn people. No offense. The Reverend Dr. Perkins insists, because of his own experience, that Christians, not just ministers and missionaries, that we must literally move into the communities that we intend to serve. It's not just about geography. It's about bridging separations of culture and race, among other things. For years, Dr. Perkins has dared churches to cross lines to get to where the suffering is. He was inspired by white preachers in 60s Mississippi who wouldn't. He wrote, I consistently find that those churches that respond most passionately to the needy are those that have sent out from their own congregations people to live and walk and eat and breathe among the poor and who have then heard their eyewitness accounts of the need, the opportunity, and the challenge. We have lines to cross, y'all, and some we do cross. On race, we walk hand in hand. We are not afraid. The truth shall make us free. We in here do live in peace, and we all shall overcome someday. With our racism and racists anonymous, we brought a few people from out there in here. I was crazy enough to start it, but y'all supported it. God willing, after a while, maybe we'll bring a few more in here, if not with the Presbyterians facing racism program, then with something else, as we continue to stoke and rekindle Trinity's spiritual birthright of work in racial justice. Because racial injustice is suffering. We go to it to try to bring healing. And I know you hear the call it's our own call. Come to Jesus. Come, suffer with us. We have literal lines to cross. Our own lot line and streets and blocks right here in this neighborhood. Neighborhood churches aren't what they used to be. Church people live all over now. We live across the Oklahoma City metro area. But watch out, but watch right outside our door is our first mission field. And we kind of reintroduced ourselves to the neighborhood in a way yesterday with a booth at one OKC just down the street. I guarantee you there are people today who know Trinity is here who did not know it before. And we'll meet some of this neighborhood's need and maybe meet some more of the people this summer by helping feed their kids. That started with a few of y'all. Hungry people are suffering people. And we will be the hands and feet of Jesus this summer once a week offering lunches of life. And if anybody thought there was a lack of suffering to attend to in Jesus' name, President Trump and the Congress are trying to hand us million more, millions more. First, Trump's executive order on, quote, religious liberty 
doesn't immediately do as much as what he and religious bigots and braggarts say it will do, thank God, but it does put the fear of God, no, it puts the fear of a false God in the hearts of lots of LGBTQIA people. And that's probably the actual aim. They want gay people to be second-class citizens again, if they have to be citizens, and they want to be able to treat them like it. Some people call it gay crow. The president's order on so-called religious liberty is vague enough to bring Jim Crow back. Can't you hear it? It is my religious conviction that black people are inferior, therefore, I do not have to bake them a wedding cake or sell them my house or rent to them or let them sit at my lunch counter. Don't think it can't happen. Gay people are about one nightmare away from a return to that kind of discrimination. They still suffer today for being who they are. To too many people, they're the lepers of our time, believed to be the worst sinners by definition. And they probably will suffer more. We all will probably suffer more before the arc of the moral universe turns finally toward justice for all. Jesus went to the accused sinners of his time, the lepers. He went to them. At some point, we should consider raising a standard outside to let the world know this safe place for us is also a safe place for gay people of faith. Hear it. Come to Jesus. Come suffer with us. Finally, millions are suffering worry and anxiety and worse already because the House of Representatives, led by hotheads, finally shoved a knife into Obamacare. Thank God there are two houses of Congress. Legislation that explodes smoking hot out of the House is said to go to the Senate to cool. The Senate doesn't seem to be as heartless as the House. Lord, hear our prayer. Obamacare is not perfect. I know that. But there's no denying that if repeal and replace passes the Senate as is, millions more will suffer. They're not just trying to get back to the way things were before Obamacare. Powerful people want to punish powerless people for daring to try to secure rights that they don't want them to have. There's punishment in that bill. Jesus is with the suffering. We won't be relaying the call of God. We'll, we'll hear it ourselves if we don't already from the legislatively downtrodden and the medically marginalized. We'll hear them call, come to Jesus, come suffer with us. Most of the evangelical church won't hear it. They're deaf, maybe dead. And half the mainline church is too. Lord, hear our prayer. Can we at least be faithful? Dr. Perkins says our success is not measured by fame. It's not measured by popularity contests. It's not measured by how many souls were won today. God doesn't call us to that kind of task. Rather, God calls us to be faithful. God calls us to faithfulness. Whatever anyone thinks of Obamacare or of any replacement that causes harm to people, we are called by God to go where the suffering is. And it'll be in some of our own homes if it's not already. What will we do? Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and selfishness and live to righteousness. By his wounds we are healed. O oh God, may we in here pay attention to one another, listen to one another, trust one another, and be honest with one another about suffering so we can see the suffering of others out there. And then, O oh God, we can be ready to meet their needs as the world that you so love cries out, Church, church, come to Jesus. Come suffer with us. Amen.